Good morning and welcome to worship here today. It's an exciting day in Springfield because we're here worshiping, right? There's something else going on later today. Jim knows. So I invite you to stand as you're able and uh, join us on this first song. at Kingsway. My name is Bree Warlick and I'm the student ministry coordinator here. We are so glad that you are able to join us today whether in person or online. 
Whether this is your first time or you are a regular guest, we ask that you would please take a few moments and fill out our Connect card. Our Connect card helps us connect with you and connect you to things that will be of value to you. There is also a space for you to share joys and concerns. At the very least, we ask that you please write your names and check the box of what service you are attending. Hang on to them, and when the offering plate comes around, drop them and your pin in. If you are online, please see our digital Connect card online and fill that out for us. This week, there are a lot of exciting things happening with Kingswood. There is a kindergarten informational meeting February 16th at 6.30. Kingsway's member enrollment begins for Kingswood on February 21st at 6.30 a.m. And open enrollment begins on February 27th at 8.30 a.m. Kingsway has a program that allows guests, returning guests, and longtime participants in the life of Kingsway a way to gain a better understanding of the ministries of Kingsway. In addition, we include information of United Methodism and membership vows of the church. No matter your level of involve involvement, we wanted to make you aware of the opportunity of our Connect program. Registration is not necessary. We have three upcoming opportunities for you to join with us. February 15th at 6 p.m. in the chapel, February 19th at 11.45 a.m. in Atkins with a light lunch provided. We know you like free food. And March 19th at 9.15 a.m. in B10. Reach out to pastors Reverend Karen Hayden or Reverend Jim Oman with questions. United Methodism teaches that baptism initiates people into the faith community and into a covenant relationship with God and God's people. Baptism can happen in any service or with any type of means, immersion, pouring, sprinkling. At Kingsway, we offer baptism any Sunday after one has talked with the past pastor. If you have been waiting to be baptized, there will be a special opportunity to do that on February 19th. Speak with Reverend Karen if you have questions. We also have a tradition that we can reaffirm our baptismal vows and renew our commitment to discipleship with the help of the Holy Spirit. We will do that in both services next Sunday. While not everyone can remember the occasion of their baptism, we can remember that we are baptized and be thankful for that. We look forward to next Sunday's baptisms and renewals. February 22nd, there will be multiple times you can join us for the implementation of ashes during the day. We will conclude this, the day with a fellowship meal at 5 p.m. and a worship service at 6 p.m. Today, we want to remind you that we are looking for persons to partner with staff to help distri distribute the ashes in one-hour shifts around town from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. If this is something that you are curious about and want to help with, please reach out to Pastor Karen. How about that? Is that better? Hey, let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Cody. I want to invite you, as we continue to prepare our hearts for worship this morning, to join me in prayer. Holy One, we enter into this space this sacred space and we fall into your hands may we find rest there this morning and soften ourselves soften our hearts open our spirits that we might be able and willing to listen to learn and to grow from your word and to be inspired by the Spirit. Be with us. Sit with us. Abide in us this morning that we might take what happens here and re-enter into your world as new people. Help us to meditate on the words shared by Jesus in the prayer in which he gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Just a reminder that we have two really incredible hours of children's activities uh, during worship, both at 9.15 and at 10.30 service, and your children are welcome to join you in service here, but if at any time you'd like to make use of our facilities, the children's wing is just that way, so you are welcome to take your kids there at any time. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Reverend Jim Oman. I'm one of the pastors here at Kingsway, and I'm so glad you're here to worship with us today, to learn a little bit, grow a little bit. I want you to know if you're here the first time, as we said earlier, we're just pleased you've taken time out of your day on a Super Bowl Sunday to come worship. I had to get that in. I grew up in Kansas City, so what am I going to say? Yay. So... We're glad you're here this morning. We've been in a series over the last few weeks uh, about learning to love and understanding who God is in our lives and how we often fall short of what God wants us to be, right? That call that we have to be one of his children. And a few weeks ago, uh, Ben Stringer, our ministry intern, uh, if you were here, talked about images of peace and justice and generosity and forgiveness that we sometimes have in our minds and uh, what that represents for us. And then last week, Pastor Karen uh, talked about her life growing up in, in the South and how understanding who she was radically changed when she got to college. And so I'm going to continue the confessional part of worship today to share a little bit of my story with you, growing up in Kansas City, Missouri, a suburb there, and how I've felt like I've come a long way from the kid that I was back then in the 1950s and 60s, and how God has continued to work in my life. One of the key things about understanding the whole journey that we're all on, no matter where we come from, has to do with putting our eyes on the prize, putting our eyes on Christ and God who has given us everything. So I want to begin this morning with a scripture that is a powerful one. It's very short, but if you want to follow along on the screen or on your phone or your pew Bible, you're welcome to. It is Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24. Examine me, God. Look into my heart. Put me to test. Know my anxious thoughts. Look to see if there's any idolatrous way in me, and then lead me on the eternal path. For the gift of Scripture, thanks be to God. Look into my heart is the psalmist's question, right? He's asking God, will you look into my heart and help me to figure out who I'm supposed to be as a person of faith? Now, As I said, I grew up in Kansas City, suburban Kansas City. Uh, I'll give my age right now. I'm 67 years old. I was born in 1955. And I uh, grew up in a a part of the city that was a part of the southern migration of people out of the inner city into the suburbs after World War II. And that's important context to understand. In most major cities in this country, after World War II, when people came back from the war and we began to rebuild our country after the war, a lot of people moved home where they were from, neighborhoods, in my case, closer to downtown, right? Neighborhoods like if you've run Kansas City, you know about Waldo and Brookside and the Plaza. And those areas that that sort of surrounded the city, the core, right? But then what happened is, is all those people came back who moved back where they came from or were looking to find a home. Then came the second big migration, and that was all the white people left that part of the city and moved to where my family bought a house. It was called Ruskin Heights. It was an area in the southern part of the city, and its claim to fame really was that it was the location of the largest tornado in our state's history until Joplin. My parents bought a rebuilt home that was in this suburban district, and um, I have to tell you, it was, a, it was almost a, like a leave it to beaver life, be honest with you. Now, my mom didn't wear pearls, but she was home all the time. She prepared all of our meals. My dad was a, a, an architect. We really consider ourselves working class. Maybe we would have been a little more upper middle class, but the reality is we were not rich and we weren't poor, right? We just found a way to survive, and we never had a want for anything. Um, And so that's the life I grew up. My dad would come home at 6 o'clock. My mom would have the uh, meal on the table at 6 o'clock. Not 6.05, not 5.45, but 6 o'clock, right? And in the summertime, my brother and I, um, I had a sister who came on later. She was an accident. But my brother and I would get up, and we would ride our bikes and take off, right? We had to be home by what time? 
6 o'clock, street lights, but 6 o'clock was dinner in our house. And if you weren't there, you didn't eat. You missed the meal. I mean, I grew up in this kind of a world. My lens was very, very much that suburban, the way we picture it on a lot of those old black and white TV shows. And it really was kind of an issue of black and white for me. Now, where I grew up, Ruskin High School, uh, was a part of this huge growth of, of schools in the Kansas City area. My graduating class was 850 students. Now, out of that 850 students, there were three persons of color. So that's the lens that I grew up looking at. That's, was, my parents were very, very spiritual people. We were church going. I never heard them speak a word of racism or ill will toward anybody. But that's the world I lived in. And when I went off to college, it was a total shock, as Karen said last week, to be in the midst of a world that was very diverse, that I really had never seen. Now, I want to come back to that point. I want you to hold on to that idea of this 18-year-old kid going off to college, uh, coming from the world I just described for you. Now, maybe you can relate to that world here in Springfield. I suspect that no matter where you grew up, you can understand that kind of a progression of life. And so how we see the world when we're adults often, well, I wouldn't say often, I say is always shaped by how we see it as children because it gets baked into our DNA. It gets baked into how we view things, and we don't ever leave that. So we have to work on changing it, right? It just doesn't happen overnight. You can suddenly be somebody different than you were as a child. Now, one of my heroes of the Bible was the Apostle Paul. He wasn't a perfect human being. But what I liked about the Apostle Paul and his writings and all of them was that he never was afraid to say what he was in the past and what he is now and how he, following his Lord Jesus Christ, continued to change and evolve as he went through life. One of the people that I looked up to as a young pastor was a professor at SMU. His name was Fred Craddock, great teaching professor, great preaching professor. And he had told the story that has stuck with me that I want to share with you. It was set in the, the 1940s in China. And when the communists took over China, basically they kicked all the missionaries out of China. All of them were forced to leave. It was a forced exit, if you will. And this particular day, a missionary couple had heard a knock on the door, and they were there, and they told them they had uh, two hours to pack all their stuff and they would go to the train station and leave, two hours, right? So think about that, they'd probably been there for years. If somebody came and said, you gotta leave in two hours, think about that. So they started going through all their stuff, right? Oh, we're gonna take this, no, we gotta take this, it's an heirloom for the family. Well, but it takes up space, it's weight. Well, I gotta have my typewriter, right? I gotta have this particular trinket or this picture they finally, after arguing about all this, felt like after going to the scales, they hit, they hit the, the amount of pounds that they could take with them. And this particular poundage, let's see, what was it? It was 200 pounds. 200 pounds. And they kept weighing it and weighing it until they got to the point that they had it right on the dot, 200 pounds. So they came to the door, the soldiers, and said, do you have your stuff ready? Yeah, it's right there. Did you weigh it? 200 pounds on the dot. And without really thinking or blinking an eye, the soldiers said, did you weigh the kids? Did you weigh the kids? Like they were counting the kids in the, the weight total. And it absolutely changed their, their perception of what reality was. No, they hadn't weighed the kids. They weren't thinking of it that way. So they had to adjust their life and adjust their, their process of how they were gonna leave. I think that happens to us all the time. And we don't always recognize it. We have moments when something really important happens and we realize that we are seeing it all wrong. Like our perception is, is really inaccurate. And we have a tendency to jump to conclusions Often we jump to blaming ourselves or blaming others for the, the, the misperception of reality. And it creates a lot of conflict in families, in marriages, with children, and in communities. This incredible change also happened to the Apostle Paul. 
Remember the story of him being blinded on the road and suddenly he couldn't see and he was told that he would follow the Lord Jesus Christ and when he could see again, his life was changed, right? So that's the Apostle Paul and he spent many, many years writing to churches, starting churches all around that part of the world. And the Apostle Paul wrote a particular letter that's one of my favorites and it's from the book of Philippians. The Philippians was a church that he had founded, and it was a church that was struggling. Now, having started a church myself, it's easy for new churches to struggle because it's not an easy thing to do. It's hard for existing churches to not struggle, like our church here or any church that that we've ever been a part of. Why? Because we're all human, and human beings make mistakes. And human beings are not who God wants them to be because we're human beings. That's the challenge. How do we get closer to being who God wants us to be? Now, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter. Remember, with all that in the background, he was a persecutor of the Christians. He killed them. He would round them up, separate the parents, and he would execute them. That's who he was. It sometimes gets left out of Scripture as we read it, but he basically had a one-man hit squad. After his conversion, if you will, after his blinding moment, right, he was a different man. So here's what he says in the, in the book of Philippians, the third chapter, 12 through 14. This is from the message, so it's a little bit more relevant to the way I think. I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I haven't made, but I'm well on my way reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, I'm not turning back. I'm off and running. I'm not turning back. I've made a commitment. Now, what do I do with this thing of life that I've lived? And this is relevant no matter how old you are, right? Every day, every day you wake up, you have a chance to be something new in Christ. Every day you have a chance to recreate yourself in this new day you have. And where you have been is important to know, but it's not as important for the future. Now, coming back to my story about going off to college, again, I had a loving family, godly church people, went to church, felt a call to ministry even at age 16, and so I go off to college. And what I experienced there was this really different world of different people, (laughs) of every size, shape, size, religion, skin color, everything was different than I'd ever been with. And I was, I was homesick, I'll be honest with you. Sitting in my dorm room, I'll never forget it, rainy day, this, these incredible cinder block walls painted gray. You remember those, anybody? Cinder block walls painted gray, it's raining. And I just sat there and I just started crying because I thought, what, where am I? I don't know anybody, but they're all different than me. You know, I was afraid. But I stuck with it and kept going trying to to stay focused on where God was leading me. And that took me to a new place. I made friends. As you probably have figured out, I'm a musician, and I, like every kid in my age group, we all had bands. We created bands. I mean, we did that when we were 12, when the Beatles hit, you know. But this was in college. I had a band. We were pretty good. We traveled around the Midwest, and uh, we had, there were a lead guitar player, I played rhythm guitar, sang, we had a bass player and a drummer. Well, the drummer, the drummer was African American. Paul was his name. Paul was African American, he'd grown up in the inner city of New York. Very different cat from me, very different cat from me. The, the kid that grew up in the, the little suburb of Kansas City. And Paul was this incredible drummer, And we really thought nothing of, you know, being together on the road, playing. And so in the summer, we would take off and we'd, we called it touring, but let's be honest, we just found a few bars and clubs that would let us come play. (laughs) And we would hit the road. Well, one particular summer, we went south. 
And I'll be honest with you, sitting here right now, I can't remember if it was Mississippi or Alabama we went to. Okay, this would have been in 1974. We go down there. We don't think anything of it. We got to this club. You know, we checked into our motel. We walk up. We get ready to do our warm-up set. And the owner came and said, you can't play here now because you have this drummer and he's not the right color. And suddenly all of my emotions about my upbringing and all the times that I had been, if not overtly racist, but under my breath, not challenging jokes just came pouring into me like I had been playing a game and not being honest with God about who I was. And that changed my life. That understanding of somebody that God had created that was just as perfect as me. And it took something like that to blind me a little bit and force me to think about my, my faith. How could I profess to be a follower of Jesus Christ who created everything and not try to do my best to change my heart to become more pure, to become more focused? I've, never, I've not made it, friends. I, in many ways, I'm still the same guy that I was in that band in the 1970s, but I know, I know that I've, I've got to be challenging myself. This morning, as we think about this series of Created to Love, I want you to hear these words. You were created to love as an expression of God's love because he loves us. And that means we love everyone, and that's hard sometimes. It's really hard to love that uncle that you can't stand. Or that neighbor that drives you crazy, right? It's hard. It is hard to do that. But we are called to love. We were created to love. That's how God created us, each of us. And so I find myself challenged all the time as I'm thinking about where I am and where I'm headed and what God is in store for me. Several Months ago, I can't remember, it was one of the sermons I preached here, and it was about an experience I had at a breakfast counter with a young man, and it was one of those challenging conversations where they find out you're a pastor, and then the questions start coming. You know, do you, what, what do you believe? Do you, what's about this? What do you believe about this? And I'm just trying to eat my, my omelet, you know, and just have my coffee, but I finally engage in the conversation. Well, this young man had, had really struggled with the church and was really struggling about how to get back to God. We talked for a while. We prayed, which was, you know, a challenge sometimes in a public place. We prayed together, and then I haven't seen him until just recently. At the same breakfast place, sitting at the counter, so when I walked in, I saw him there, and I almost turned around and walked out. <laughs> I'm just being honest. It's a confession day, right? I almost walked out. But then I went back and sat down, and I said, well, how's it going? He goes, well, before you ask me, I've not been to church, so don't. And I said, well, this coming Sunday, he goes, well, it's a Super Bowl. And I said, dude, Super Bowl's at 530. You got time to come to church. And we laughed about it, but my point is, Sometimes we're going to find ourselves in places like that where we have to challenge ourselves about the assumptions we make about people, what they look like, how they talk, what kind of faith do they have, if any, what kind of music do they like, what, how do they live, and it's very different than our world. We live often in a very comfortable world. My point in sharing this is not to guilt you into doing something. It's for you to know that the gospel, the good news is, it's never too late for any of us to look into our hearts and say, how am I not following the way Jesus would have me live? And believe me, I've done it many times. Believe me, there are some days that it's hard. Even this morning to get up, I was thinking, I don't really want to go share all this, but my gosh, Ben did, and Karen did, and well, I guess I need to talk a little bit about who I am and where I come from. But I know it's a challenge. So what I'm saying today as you think about this, there may be moments, and I don't know what your issue is. I mean, I have certain issues. I'm not going to tell you those. I'm not going that far with the confession. But I'm working on them. 
I'm working on them. I'm trying to, to think and to live, to pray, to study. And to me, the place that if you can't come to church and be honest with God and say, Lord, I need to do better, help me find a way, then why are we here? We're not here to simply sing and hear a sermon and put money in the plate. We're here to be challenged. So today, think about those words that Paul wrote. I want to read them again for you. I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I have made it, but I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this. But I got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. Wherever you are today is a new day to begin to lean into the future. And that's the message of hope, good news. It's a message you can take with you as you walk out the door today. Here in a few minutes, our children are going to sing, and you're going to feel really good about seeing children praising God in worship. It's always a blessing to take something positive from church. Those words of Paul, to me, are life-changing. None of us have made it, but we're well on our way. Take that in your heart as you go into the world this week. Let us pray. Glorious God, today as we celebrate, we're aware that we've not gone as far as we should go. We're aware, Lord, that we need more strength and courage sometimes to challenge all the assumptions that come to us. Lord, today I pray for everyone here who experiences this worship that they might feel the presence of the Holy Spirit on their heart and that they might understand that they have a chance to be something that they're not yet. Help us to always be confident that you're walking with us, even when we take three steps back, you help us tip, take two forward. So we pray today, Lord, for the service and all the words that have been shared, all the songs that will help us to become who you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We appreciate you being here today, and if this is your first time, Please understand that that is your gift to us to be present, so you don't need to worry about the offering this morning. We have many ways that you can contribute through online giving or texting or the old-fashioned snail mail or drop it by the office or put it in the offering plate today. It's important that you give because giving is a practice thing and generosity comes from practicing it every day. So let us give now and give abundantly. Amen. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. You give
but they haven't even sung yet and I already feel better. I feel great. I love seeing them in here and I love having them with us. It's going to be awesome this morning. clap again. Wasn't that cool? If that doesn't get you pumped up for a new day today, I don't know what will. So remember, lean into the future, right? Lean into the future. Amen. Have a great day. Go Chiefs.
again